Okay, good evening. Sorry, we were discussing business. All right, it is our study session tonight, and so we're going to discuss the comprehensive plan and zoning code. I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Tammy. Oh, Tammy, turn your mic on. Thank you. Sorry. Tonight, we are going to have a representative from Johnson & Associates. They are going to be talking about the comprehensive plan as well as uh, the new zoning codes that they are working on. Yeah. Thank you. Clicker here. Hi. Hi. Um, we have the presentation. Great. Let me make sure. All right. I'm Kelly Driscoll. I'm an urban planner at Johnson & Associates. We're an engineering and planning firm in Oklahoma City. Um, and today, we're just going to do a brief overview of um, the comprehensive plan that, um, that should look familiar to you all that was adopted in October. Um, and then we'll go over your existing um, development codes and then the code project that we are working on. So there's um, a few documents that deal with uh, land development, and they have kind of different legal standings. The comprehensive plan is a long range policy document. It's meant to guide decisions by um, bodies such as yourself and planning commission. Um, your zoning regulations are law, so they are regulations. Those outline the uses that can happen within certain zoning districts, as well as maybe building form and how far back it is from the street, things like that. And then of course your subdivision regulations, pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> uh, regulates how you divide and plat your land. It also has some provisions in there for um, public improvements, what those standards are. So again, you all adopted this in October. Um, Robbie is here from team. We worked on this with them and ADG. Um, and of course, council and planning commission, as well as various stakeholders and the public were involved. And so there's a few reasons why um, cities do comprehensive plans. Um, one is our state statutes outline that um, a city's ordinances and land use decisions should be um, consistent with your comprehensive plan. But also, you want to plan for growth. UConn had not done a new comprehensive plan in a number of years. And so if you don't plan for that growth, you kind of get in this cycle of catch up on maintenance and keeping up with roads and utilities and things like that. And then, of course, there's also the philosophical basis. You want to get your input from your residents and people that live and work here. What do they want to see for UConn in the future? So all of that goes into a comprehensive plan. Um, now, each chapter in the plan outlined um, issues and then, of course, the policies um, <clears throat> to address those issues. These are just a kind of a highlight for tonight. Uh, the population trends for UConn are really in line with what we see for Oklahoma as a whole and, and the United States. Uh, your major employers tend to be more service-oriented and uh, retail, commercial-type uses. And along those lines, a large amount of your population is leaving Yukon for work. Not a lot of people live and work here. Um, and as you all know, uh, municipalities in Oklahoma need sales tax dollars. And when people are working in other municipalities, they might you know, spend money there on their way home so you don't get those um, sales tax dollars contributing to the municipal budget. Um, and, and then as far as your housing stock, uh, the majority of it is single family detached. There's not a lot of um, <clears throat> what's called kind of the missing middle housing, different types, townhomes, condos, duplexes, things like that. Um, and then what apartments you do have tend to be a little bit older and there might be some maintenance issues with, with what is there. Um, your developable area in Yukon, while the city is pretty large, is limited by that large floodplain that you have for the Canadian River. I'll go into that a little bit more here in a minute. So another reason why it's important to plan is for growth. And Canadian County, this is kind of an older image here, <clears throat> but showing that extrusion of how much growth Canadian County has seen um, in comparison to other uh, counties in Oklahoma. 
And you all may have heard Oklahoma City touting their numbers in the new uh, 2020 census. And while we don't have um, Yukon specific numbers yet, I was able to get uh, Canadian County. And <laughs> since 2010, the county has seen 34% growth. And we don't expect, like on this chart here, you see that um, Yukon's percentage of the county is about 20%. We don't think that's gonna change too much from um, that table there to 2020 numbers. So, um, Could I ask a last yeah, question absolutely. On, do you, so, it's kind of the typical question when we talk about Yukon and population and mm -hmm. these terms. Is that 20% representative of our zip code or our or That's our city limits? City limits, okay. yeah. Um, so developable area. This map shows um, kind of the hatched area is the flood way of the Canadian River. The blue area is your 100-year flood plain, and the orange is the 500-year flood plain. And so this really limits um, the intensity of development that can happen in those areas. And <clears throat> when you take that out, there's only about 15% um, land area left in Yukon. So um, the meat of the plan um, and what's used a lot by Planning Commission and City Council is what's called the future land use map. And this gives kind of broad designations for uh, land uses within the city. So you'll see there's large blue area again, that's the, that floodplain, this designated open space. And that doesn't necessarily mean that no development can happen there. There can be lower intensity um, larger agricultural and um, residential developments there. And then uh, the green area is that agricultural use. When you take those two out, the next largest component is that low intensity. And that tends to be your already developed single family subdivisions and maybe some smaller scale retail or office uses within the city. And I won't go into all of the designations, but I just highlighted a couple here for you. Um, the employment land, again, uh, driving that need to have people be in Yukon working and living. Um, the purple areas are areas that are well served by your existing transportation and rail and could accommodate kind of some of those light industrial or office park uses to keep people um, in Yukon and working here. There's not any density um, outlined for this designation. Some of the other ones do have that. And then the urban intensity is the only place it's applied is really your downtown because that is so unique. Um, <clears throat> the development pattern is just so different from the other areas of Yukon. Um, there's a need to preserve that character and um, you know have it just different different standards for that. So it allows um, a little bit more intense uh, density for commercial and residential in that area than you might see in that yellow area, for instance, on the map. So moving along to zoning, uh, this is your zoning map, looks a lot like your land use map. Um, so there's a lot of green there up by the river. Um, Yukon zoning code is adopted as an appendix to your municipal code. Um, it's got your base zoning districts with those permitted uses and bulk standards in there. <clears throat> and then you've got PUDs to address uh, performance impacts to maybe surrounding properties or the community as a whole. Um, there are nine articles within it. Um, and while it does cover a lot, it does not cover everything that, do, that deals with land development in Yukon. For instance, landscaping standards are in a different chapter, <coughs> building standards, yet another chapter, signs, another chapter. So for folks who are looking to do development in Yukon, it might be a little confusing. And then for, uh, for staff administering things, it's just a little bit more complicated to have stuff spread out. And I will say this is not unique to Yukon. It, it happens over time, you know, when you have an older code and it gets amended and things just get um, a little bit more separated out. Um, and then the subdivision regulations is also an appendix. It's Appendix B. 
um, sets those standards for your streets, your right-of-way widths, easements, lots and blocks, and of course the procedures for dividing and platting of land. Um, there's six articles in your subregs, and interestingly, one appendix to the appendix, and it's also Appendix B, which is just a little bit of funny um, nomenclature there. Um, the code project is really looking at all of these um, regulations that deal with land development within Yukon. So zoning, subdivision, your sign chapter, landscaping, um, building codes, specifically those architectural standards for commercial properties. And what we're hoping to do is develop a uh, hybrid zoning code. So um, that can really take elements from conventional zoning, which is what Yukon's code is now, and fold in some of those performance standards that you might see in planned unit developments or really deal with impacts to surrounding uh, properties better. But one of the really important things is the addition of graphical representation uh, for people who don't read codes every day, it can be a little challenging to understand them. And so um, what this code will include is some illustrations to help people, oh, okay, that's where my building can go or the parking needs to be situated here, things like that. So it'll be easier to understand. Um, we're seeing the, we will likely have a final draft ready for adoption in early next year. Um, we've got five phases here. <clears throat> and then um, we've done a little bit of, re we've done review of um, your existing codes and found some initial findings. I won't read these off for you, but. <clears throat> and again, this is not unique to Yukon. Many municipalities, when you have code that's been amended over time, you get some duplicative um, terminology or um, or if it hasn't been updated for a long time, you know, you might have uses in there that just don't exist anymore, like telegraph stations and, and things like that that you just don't need. So we'll look at all those, consolidate them, get rid of the ones that you don't need. Um, <clears throat> we've also found you guys have a lot of conditional uses and we're gonna try and get a handle on that and figure out what really needs to be conditional and what might be a better way to um, approach some of those. And um, our initial recommendations are to form an advisory board, um, consolidate everything into one place that deals with development in Yukon. So, and that's usually called a Unified Development Code or UDC. Um, again, consolidate and clarify all of your uses. There's hundreds of them. <laughs> um, and clarify your processes and administration. Right now, that's kind of split around in various portions of the code, so it would all be in one section, so it's really easy to understand. Um, and align your code with some changes in land use case law and state statutes that have happened, and then with the comprehensive plan where, where that makes sense. Um, also, your PUDs right now are done as an overlay, so you guys have to take two actions on one piece of property um, to rezone it. So we're, we're gonna investigate whether it makes sense to make that a, a base district um, itself, so it's just not as confusing for folks going through the process and administering. And then one thing we've heard from staff and others is the need for a um, what's called a simplified planning planned unit development district, and that would be basically a PUD, but for smaller projects that are less than five acres, so maybe that infill development that needs a little bit special treatment. Um, so we'll look at that as well. And then also um, update your street, sidewalk, and public improvement standards that are found within your sub -rakes. Uh, so far, we kicked off in June. Um, we have formed the advisory board. Uh, we introduced the project just like I'm here today. We went to a July study session with the Planning Commission. Um, we did that in-depth review of your existing regulations. Um, one thing that staff has asked us to do is look at all of your fees and how they align with other municipalities in the area. So we're working on that right now. Uh, we're also working on a draft outline of the UDC and that will provide that shell for us to uh, draft. And then also um, a finalizing, we're working on finalizing that meeting schedule. 
Um, when we met with Planning Commission in July, um, there were a number of things that they brought up. Um, <clears throat> I won't read everything here for you, but um, they, they really voiced um, concern that Main Street and I-40 needs some special attention. Um, they, they love what, um, what Edmond has done in their downtown area as far as spurring redevelopment and what that end product looks like. Um, obviously, as you all know, uh, you require platting, and so you guys end up with the replat of a replat of a replat, and um, they express some uh, consternation over that and keeping up with just where exactly that is, so we'll look at that. Uh, one issue that came up at the very end, which there was really not a consensus on it, was Airbnb and whether that's a use that uh, makes sense for Yukon. Do we not allow Airbnbs? No. The setup of our current zoning does not allow that use. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we've been asked to do or mm -hmm. consider so that's why she's asking the council yeah. is that something you want to consider but if it is then there's special requirements of parking stuff mm -hmm. that we'd have to address through this process but okay. i think that's it what just she's surprised really me asking. yeah 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 well our ordinance is so old the uses yeah. are very specific yeah. and yeah. that's and airbnb's one of the problems just that really have. picked up lately yeah. Uh -huh. yeah because to actually be rental place like that that's by the night it actually becomes an r3 property which becomes an mm -hmm. apartment type deal or a transition mm -hmm. it's really not the same no yeah no no okay so yeah that just surprised me thanks yeah um so as far as next steps uh just like i'm here tonight we're going to um board of adjustments next scheduled meeting which i believe is in october to introduce the project to them um, we're going to work on drafting sections of the code. Uh, we've outlined some targeted outreach for those people that really are heavy users of the code, so engineers, developers, um, sign professionals. So we'll be having some meetings with them. Um, of course, the meetings with the advisory board and planning commission. And then we plan to be back before you in December with some sections for you to review. We aren't going to give you everything all at once, so it it'll be a little bit more sizable mm -hmm. and digestible. Um, well, you'll get that well in advance of your meeting, so you can review those. And then, of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, but this is also some contact information for myself and Mark Zitzow in our office, and of course, Robbie and Mitchell, which you mm -hmm. all know, of course, too. So, do you have so any questions? who's on the advisory board? That is, let's see, um, community development, city manager's office, help me, Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> the advisory board is set up with uh, uh, me, uh, me, Kathy, that's in our department. We do have Jason Beal in, in it as well. We do have <coughs> Johnson Associates. They actually have three planners. Ms. Kelly's one of them. They're actually showing up. Uh, we are pulling in the planning commission on quarterly meetings to be part of that. Mm -hmm. So we'll get the hard work done and give it to them. We talked about bringing it to you quarterly, but we figured with the way we have to present it and stuff, it'd be a little cumbersome mm -hmm. to have quarterly meetings with you. But that's why she was talking about we'll send pieces to you, and we hope that you give us your input. Okay. Uh, we are going to get you know input from developers and sign contractors mm -hmm. and anybody that would be using it or has land that would be impacted by what we do. So any of the landholders that still has land to develop, we're going to try to include we'll them include if them. they want to be included. So. Because to make it work, we have to have everybody's input anyway. Right. What are you going to ask, Rick? Yeah, I wanted to ask a question about this comprehensive. How often do we do these things? Because I see there's a disconnect a lot of times between a planning commission that we have and the comprehensive plan. In the last, say, six months, I think we've had some discourse here and I'm trying to figure out, is it the comprehensive plan that's wrong, or is it our constituents wrong? I've been told that every piece of land that's left to develop is going to be hard to develop because they don't want it in their backyard. Mm -hmm. It's typically what happens. And I think Kelly, with her experience, she can tell you about all the problems that she's been through over the years. But the last pieces of land anywhere in the state of Oklahoma or anywhere seems to be nobody wants it. 
it's going to be too much traffic. It's going to be a big impact on the water and sewer. You know, they just don't want those people because they don't have the same type of house I have. I mean, it goes on and on for all kinds of excuses. Or I bought because it was a field. Yes. Kids play well, out this there. makes it a real difficult situation for a councilman because I'm supposed to be representing X number of people, and hey, if they don't like it, they may have to live with it because if if it helps the entire city, we're going to have to bend. Well, the staff tries to present it to you meeting the ordinance or the code requirements. Right. It's the planning commission's determination to make sure we applied it correctly or if they feel it's appropriate, as well as you have the final say with the recommendations. It's bet, you know, the, the advisory board or the planning commission or city council is the ones that makes that final decision. Is that something that we want? Is that something that's going to improve quality of life? And that's the thing that staff looks at and tries to present to you. You know, All right. we try to look at those future uses, but it, sometimes, like I said, people just don't want to look back. Thank you. But there's a lot of things that are playing into. Well, yeah, well, that's just portable back, housing and stuff. Back in the 50s and 60s, they didn't want to grow. So that's why all the land was given to Oklahoma City. So right. now, now, you know, we want to yeah. grow or not grow. Right. Maybe we don't want to go. I don't know how the people feel about wanting to grow, but apparently they all want to move here. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, through the comp plan process, you know, we did that uh, public survey and, and people really wanted to see. Um, some beautification of your existing arterial corridors and maybe some increased landscaping standards. So that's some of those things that, um, as far as aligning with the comp plan, those will get taken out and worked into the new code. Um, and again, the comp plan is a guide. Um, I was a planner in Oklahoma City for a number of years, and they had a quote unquote new comp plan. It was adopted in 2015. <laughs> Um, and it has a lot of things that are contrary to their existing regulations. Yeah. And so they're in this kind of in-between period. They're, they're in the process of updating their code. And it is difficult. I kind of describe it as purgatory. You know, you're, you're stuck and you're pulled in all these directions. Um, but ultimately, the, the comp plan is that guide for you guys, the decision makers, to frame um, each individual land use decision, and it is a guide for you. Just nobody, information. Right, nobody wants it in their backyard, but everybody wants us to beautify. Right. And the only way we can do that is if we increase our tax base. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so it's a very hard yeah. decision. It is. It is. Okay, anybody else have some questions? Okay. No? Okay. Do you have any more? No, nope, that was it. That's it? That's okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. All right. Who do you have next? Madam Mayor, um, we would like to talk about some drainage ditches. Um, I've asked Mitchell to give a presentation um, this evening. I would like to give a little bit of an intro. Um, in this past year, we have had an unusual amount of rain that has happened. Um, this has caused uh, an amount of erosion that has surpassed what we've had in the past. We've had projects, drainage ditches that um, have been okay, uh, but with all of this rain that we receive, we've had some flooding and uh, some of the erosion has really, as you will see on some of these pictures, has, has just been astronomical. Um, there's some things that we priced a year ago that uh, aren't even close to what it's gonna cost us today. So I'm gonna let Mitchell give you the presentation on the drainage ditches that we have that uh, are on our priority list. This is one of the projects that we're talking about. We call this Yukon Avenue Kimball Park. Basically, it, you can see what it looks like at that time. That's actually a little over a year ago. Uh, and it had some washing and stuff. Uh, we did have a cost at that time to do what needed to be done. Uh, this, this is where it has come apart since we had the large rains. Uh, 
one of the things that you know we have a, a big concern about we have neighbors that are coming to us like on this one that is eroding their property away so uh, we're bringing it to you for your consideration uh, as well as we're working with the engineers and there's certain things we have to do and if we have uh, questions in reference to some of the issues we have or I'll be here as well to discuss it uh, as you know that Kimball Park lays within a floodplain it has a floodway and a floodplain um, large amounts of waters during rain events tend to uh, flood the streets there as well a lot of it we are looking at trying to uh, move the water a little better through that but we also got to remember that what we're doing is not going to take care of all the issues and we want you to understand that because the water and the intensities we're having the the last five years six years eight years are different than what we used to have 15 or 20 years the intensities are more we're getting more water at one time you know it's like the bottom of the bucket drops out completely uh, what we're proposing to do if I can do this see if this will work this right here this dark area here that is one of the proposed projects that we're proposing it's actually two projects we're putting into one uh, like uh, we we're saying you know this is what it looks like today this is what it looked like a year, year and a half ago or so so we're trying to be on top of these projects as quick as we can mm -hmm. and try to address them this project here with both projects together tying it together which was being recommended by the city engineer as well as us meeting and discussing it with the property owners uh, basically that's a hundred twelve thousand dollar project And that's a quote we got from our uh, on-call contractor uh, working with the city engineer. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what we're required to do because we've got several of these projects, but there is some certain permitting we have to do, certain engineering we'll have to do to do some of this. Uh, so this is Kingsgate Road. It's Westport West. Uh, this is an area that you can't really see. It's overgrown. Uh, it's scouring. It's getting close to uh, a sewer line that we have there. Uh, as you can see, you can't really tell. It's something you actually physically have to go out and look at. Uh, we've been looking at this since I think it was 2013. Uh, it's got bigger. It's actually, you see this fence here hanging? There was actually a uh, fence that attached to that going to the south and you could actually walk behind it a couple of years ago but this last year and a half it's washed that out and it's hanging in the air it doesn't show that like I said it's one of those areas you'd have to actually physically go look at uh, <coughs> we had an estimate I think about 30 some thousand a year ago but the last rain event we had you can see the washing which you can't really tell it, but it's a wide ditch now compared to when it was just, I think 12, 15 feet wide when we originally started, don't you think, Arnold? Uh, it's deeper, it's wider. Uh, you can kind of see here, you can't really tell. Uh, there's a better picture of that fence. And you can see the trees that are washing out, they're falling into the drainage area and they're scouring, so the ditch is getting wider when these trees are falling off into it. It's deeper than we can handle. You know, we looked at trying to do it ourselves, but it's gonna take some heavy equipment and we did get with our engineer and we did talk to our on-call contractor. Uh, this as well, as you can see, this is the area here that we're talking about. Uh, it is a floodplain floodway. We're getting a lot of water. This pond kind of acts as a detention pond this green area uh, we do have detention ponds up out of this subdivision up the hill from it trying to slow the water down but it's just an area that takes a lot of water uh, the dark area as you can see that's the proposed area that we think we need to address one of the other things we have there's a sewer line that runs along here uh, we're afraid that it's going to scour enough that the sewer line is going to roll off into the ditch. It's getting close. It's real close to one of the manholes. And we have done some work here, drainage work, 
up the street and stuff, trying to take care of the property owners. Uh, this project's $142,000 now, almost a, 143 in a year ago, it was 40 some thousand. But there's that, that much rain this spring that mm -hmm. would have effect on it. Uh, uh, Bass Bridge, what we call Bass Bridge, this is one that you approved the other day. Uh, that was an area, you can see the retaining wall that was falling. What we're trying to do is follow the places that have the worst areas that need to be addressed, that has the potential impact of damage in people's houses. Um, uh, that's the before picture. Uh, they are working on it now. Uh, you can see what it's looking like on the left is where they uh, dug it up. Uh, on the left, they poured the concrete bottom. So we are trying to address what we can with the money that we're allowed, and that was a $25,000 project. Uh, this is Yukon Avenue. Uh, this picture here, this is looking to the uh, south off Yukon Avenue Bridge. This is looking back from the south to the north at the bridge. You can see we're having some scouring here as well as here. Uh, this is looking basically from the the north, looking back to the south. You can see all this in here, and this is the same thing here. It's kind of a little overgrown, so we're looking at doing something with this project. Actually, uh, team design is actually working on uh, doing the modeling that we're required to do for the 404 core permit that we're required to have and obtain which deals with when we're working on drainage, when we take a channel like that, we actually have to have special permitting and stuff from the federal government before we can go in there and do a lot of that work. Uh, so, uh, like I said, we're looking at all the issues. Uh, we're trying to address them. It's kind of one of those things we've kind of got uh, rain events that's caused us issues. I know jumping on them quicker probably would help us. But what we brought to you tonight with these two projects that we have, not counting the Yukon Avenue Bridge project, we're at $255,000 for those that we call the, uh, you know, the Kimball Park and the Kingsgate. Uh, like I said, it's just, just these rain events has caused us a problem. Like I said, we're trying to do the best we can. Like I said, we're not going to solve everybody's problems. Uh, we wish we could. Water's kind of uncontrolled. Uh, I do, like I said, or Robbie's here. He can discuss it a little bit more and talk about water and how we handle it, but it's in a flood plain and it's mm -hmm. pretty well determined at one time or another you're going to get flooded. And the longer we put it off, the worse it's going to get. And the more yes, and that's why I was kind of showing you these two projects. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, you know, right now, that we know of, with just in a quick count, we have 16.3 miles of uh, urbanized area that's not in concrete. It's, uh, it's raw land, it's like they like it. Uh, they like those green buffers. Uh, that's one of the things they're trying to push us towards instead of these concrete channels. Uh, repairing areas is what they call them. And then of the improved concrete line channels, we have about two miles. Question next. Some of the one of those pictures you showed were those houses in a floodplain that we built. A lot of the houses over there, the floodplain map come in. I think 1979. The houses are pre-firm. They were built prior to the floodplain maps determining them to be in that. Anything that was built after that is what we call one-foot freeboard. But at the same time, sometimes those maps change. Mm. So in our ordinance, and then we've had for 20 some years, we have what we call two foot freeboard. So actually that house is built two foot out of the base flood elevation. So to take in consideration those rain events or those possibilities of that map changing, because the map changes and they're getting, they're changing to a product, I think it's called a risk map. And there's actually maybe another map that's coming out. Yeah. So you, it puts you in a risk and a rating of that. But a lot of the houses are pre-firm. 
Thank you. So we need to do it, but where do we get the money? <laughs> well, uh, that's where we're coming to you. I think mm -hmm. we'd have to do a budget amendment to mm -hmm. take that and, and change that. Uh, that's probably what we'd recommend to you uh, tonight. Mm -hmm. Do we have the money to? We're going to have to take it out of capital, capital. out of sales tax mm -hmm. capital. Um, we will be coming to you at the next agenda, the next meeting, and bringing those forward for your, pending your approval. Mm -hmm. But the good news is at least we yeah. have money to Yeah, to and finance. those costs don't mm -hmm. inc include the cost of permitting or the engineering that we have to have mm -hmm. and the modeling. So mm -hmm. and those costs we'll make sure include those engineering fees that we'd have. We don't anticipate any of the federal monies either from the last allocation or the new infrastructure that's no. fallen under any of that. Mm -mm. No, sir. Where do we have other areas that are today looking like these projects looked a year or two ago? We are doing our best to address all the issues. Uh, a lot of people want, they'll say, I want my ditch lined, but there's a lot of issues and that come into that. Um, it might be better for Robbie to address that or maybe Joe, David, because when you start concrete and that causes other problems because the sure. water gets there quicker so forth uh, like I said I think the areas that we're addressing is trying to protect our infrastructure and try to protect some people's property you know they're gonna get water in the yard then that's one of the things we hear a lot about I've got water in my yard so I'm flooding the whole key is to keep the water out of their house if we can mm -hmm. and try to keep it out of their garage you know sometimes we got a couple of places that we have issues on large rain events uh, we're trying to remove fences out of drainage easements sometimes that becomes a problem because they don't want people walking behind their house but the drainage easement's open for a reason. You know, you got the water going underneath it as well as through a channel or secondary overflow. Um, uh, I try not to get too far off topic. I think it, it's in line is um, what is our interest, our restrictions to, to address the Highway 4 drainage on the west side of, I'm sorry, on the east side of the highway? Because there are, there is you know we're invested in the in the new road uh but there's also citizens <laughs> along that along that drainage too and i'm not sure what what our obligation is what our you know wh how much can we do or not do i mean is that some <laughs> i don't mean to just throw you a ball out of right field that it's just on top i mean it's connected to all the same all the all the places that we looked at drain to there so I'm curious. But that uh, was designated as a floodplain. That is a that's in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the tributary that carries that water is a floodway. The problem with that is we're talking about an extreme amount of money to for permitting, basically, as well as trying to remove that much material. Because there's a lot of material there would have to be removed. We're restricted by ODOT about the width of that drain easement. Uh, ODOT doesn't want to address that. Uh, but like I said, I you know Joe probably could talk a little bit more about that because uh, I have not been involved with ODOT in their discussions of that channel okay. or past history of that channel. But I know keeping it maintained and mowed is one of the things. But with the rain events we've had, you've noticed it's scoured. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to get on the east side of it now to maintain it like we used to. Right. So. Well, the uh, the work over at um, um, Kimball Park uh, would would that um, help the drainage over behind those homes on Kingston Drive by Spencer Farms? As you, as you, we talked about, well, you've seen the map. Mm -hmm. They're going to flood one time or another, unfortunately. The whole idea is try to get that water in there as fast as you can and out of there as fast as you can. Uh, but we can't guarantee them they won't ever flood because they're in the map. The federal government's determined it's a, a potential. Uh, you have a 1% chance of every year flooding, if not more. Okay. And these 100 year rain events and 500 year rain events, we're having more and more of them all the time. So and the prices that we've been given for these projects, uh, depending on the length of time it takes for us to complete them, are those prices guaranteed? The prices for the uh, from the on-call contractor are good. Uh, the 
fees that we don't know about is the engineering, the surveying, what's going to be required by the courts for the 404 permits, those costs we don't know yet. Right. And then we're working on getting those costs together because there's certain things they have to submit to be able to change a full, uh, it basically it's waters of the state, they call it the blue line. The state has determined what waters are. A lot of our tributaries that carry water are waters of the state. So it's mm -hmm. a 404. So it requires a permit from the Corps to do that. Okay. So those costs and what they require of us sometimes are uncontrolled, but we work well with team and we'll make sure we try to control our costs. But there's certain things we have to do. Right. So this is just the bare minimum. That's for actual work. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. talking about what we have to do for yeah. permitting and obtaining the permit and the cost mm -hmm. of the permit. And, yeah. and of course, we're dealing with a floodplain and the floodway and the engineering they have to do, they have to model it. So there's a lot of things that go in it. But again, the longer it. we leave it, the worse yeah. it's going to get and the more it's going to cost yes. us. Um, okay. Any other questions? Do you have anything else for us? I. Is that enough? That's enough tonight, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we got more things on the agenda, but that's enough for tonight. Okay. All right. Do you have anything else? No, ma'am. All right. Thank We're going to adjourn and be back here at 7 o'clock.